Welcome, everyone, to Mystery, a podcast about myths and history. I am one of your hosts, Bryant, with my permanent guest, Cammy. Hi, Cammy. Hi, Bryant. How are you? I am fantastic. I'm celebrating the last days of Saturnalia. Mystery is a show where we like to pick topics from legends to epics to ancient Roman Christmas. And we actually, today's topic is... Uh, we're going to be talking about Spartacus, so we're keeping with this Roman stuff. So Spartacus probably had a couple Saturnalias in his time, and we actually just uh, did. We had this topic on a live stream that we did for a nice, uh, a, an amazing experience convention, an online podcast convention, or, or I guess you'd say online content creator convention. Um, called Indie Pods United, and they have their own YouTube channel and Facebook group. Check that out. You can actually see our live show that we did from that and much, much more on their stuff. So, but we, it, it, it was a little interesting for Cammy and I. Um, so we thought, and, and we, we didn't spend, we did like uh, questions and all sorts of stuff. We interacted with, with the peoples. So we thought we did like give this uh, a proper full standard mystery episode right before the new year too. Happy, Happy new, new year. year. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're going to talk about today. So Spartacus, we're going to talk about this dude. You might have heard of him from the old movies with, was it Kirk Douglas or Kirk Douglas's dad? Am I getting it confused? I think it's Kirk Douglas, uh, which I have not seen. Uh, <laughs> or the know. show, there was the famous show as well, but the movie, the movie's the really famous one. It's the I Am Spartacus line came from. And anyway, so we're going to talk about this, this person and some of the background of it. Cammy please regale us with your story. All right. So I used Wikipedia and Penelope.uchicago.edu, the histories of Appian. Our Thracian hero, Spartacus, fought bravely among the Roman soldiers until Crassus betrayed him. He was sold along with other able-bodied men to the school of gladiators in Capua. His life looked bleak, but he did not lose hope. At night, when their training was over, Spartacus would rally the men with stories of freedom and plans of overthrowing their captors. At first, only a few would gather around to hear him, but soon the entire school was ready to take action. One day, just before their training would start, armed only with clubs and the utensils stolen from the common kitchen, they overtook the well-armed guards. Then they set for higher ground. They settled on Mount Vesuvius and made a camp that they could easily defend. They attacked travelers on the way up to the mountain and armed themselves with the, with the spoils taken through robbery. Rome, not considering the threat of a little over 70 men very serious, only set makeshift units to deal with the problem. But these men were not trained well in the art of gladiatorial fighting, so they fell to Spartacus easily. The Republic then sent Verinius on his prized horse along with his men to return the slaves to the school. But Spartacus captured his horse and almost the man himself. As news spread through the Appian Way, many deserted their positions in life as slaves or freed farmers and took up arms with the great leader. Seventy men became 70,000. Now Rome and the council were fearful of this great man. They sent two legions to defeat him, but Spartacus escaped with most of his men. He would crucify any Roman soldier he came across to warn his men of the fate that awaited them if they did not win every battle. With still more legions at his back, Spartacus left any livestock and possessions he won from fighting and refused to gather more men on his way to Pycium. While there, he again hastily dispatched the legions waiting for him. Three years had passed, and Spartacus had amassed a wealth of weapons that would easily rival that of Rome. But Rome had a weapon in the old enemy of Spartacus. Crassus formed, a, formed six legions and slaughtered any man among them who did not see he did not see fit to win against the gladiator fearing crassus more than the enemy the remaining men fought bravely in the times of battle and defeated many of spartacus's army crassus then heard of the news of pompey's return from spain and the council had agreed to send the young general to fight alongside crassus who was now in sicily crassus could not risk the glory and purple robes robes being draped upon another man so he pressed into battle with spartacus Crassus charged his men in the line of battle, and Spartacus's men met them, but this move would cost Spartacus dearly, for a spear met with the hero's thigh, and he sank to the battleground. 
his men following him to their deaths. His body was never recovered, but the legend of his bravery from the humblest of backgrounds remains in our minds, as does the glory of Rome. Yes, that is a great way to put it. And I, you know, um, I've mentioned it. I mentioned it, I think, even last time. I don't have a, a great deal of knowledge on old, on Rome, on Roman history and stuff like that. But uh, this story, which I was aware of just due to the I am Spartacus kind of stuff, um, did kind of bring attention to Crassus and Pompey. The They were a part of the triumvirate, right? Yes. Yeah, and that, that was essentially like a, a, a three way of splitting the the central government in a way yeah, yeah. So crassus pompey and caesar were the second triumvirate right that's right and crassus he is i don't know if the word crass uh etymologically <laughs> comes from him but he he's he's known as like the richest man in rome and he was definitely a, a bad dude now spartacus we have a lot on him but it's really interesting because we know there are these these the, the important things here are who is Spartacus, the servile wars, specifically this is the third and final servile war, and then sort of how Spartacus kind of came about, came back, came came back bigger than ever today. And really, this is where we we get him from. So Spartacus, this the time period we're talking about is he he died essentially like uh 73 BCE. So this is when he was around. Now, this is sort of yeah, at the height of like Rome um, in a way. And uh, again, like it just kind of puts your head in where we are. So like the Rome is sort of said to have been founded like 600, 500 BC. Homer said to have been around anywhere between writing, you know, the Il Iliad and Odyssey and stuff between 800 to 1200 BCE. So we're, we're at 73 BC. We're getting to the 80s. Lots happening. And Spartacus was... Uh, described as a, a Thracian uh, man of, of nomadic uh, stock is sort of how he's described. Um, Plutarch actually specifically says that. And Plutarch, he was around 80, 46 to 80, 119. He was a, a, a Greek philosopher. And so even, even a couple hundred years um, after this, or a little over a hundred years after this, this was still a really important topic for a lot of people. And it's it's kind of important where he's from too. So like Thrace, if I remember right, is like an Asia, Asia Minor, like Turkey today. Yeah, I think and, it's um, modern day Hungary. Oh, okay, cool. So Baltic area, it's a tumultuous area where a lot of nomadic people live because of the, it's, it's big, it's open, especially if you go towards like the steppes area where you would find like the Turks, the Mongols um, origins. It is, it's, it breeds tough human beings for its tough uh, environments and conditions. So, and, and Spartacus was seen as this like rough and tough dude. If you think of like a uh, stereotypical gladiator, but he kind of fits that bill from what it seems like, but he was also really cunning and he did serve in the military before he was enslaved and, or in, and, and everything. And so he had a, a background and a history of combat and it shows like the craziest thing that he did. So he, they did go to Mount Vesuvius after the revolt. I was, when you were saying your story about how they got kitchen utensils, which is what was reported. I'm just thinking like, thank God Rome didn't adopt the chopstick because like I wouldn't that have just sucked you gotta like stab people's eyes out um but th when they were in Mount Vesuvius so Vesuvius they were kind of like cornered I mean if it's a mountain so it's like yeah it's hard for us to get up there but we can you know crash this army can just chill around it you're surrounded you're screwed we're gonna uh, siege you know 90 percent of a siege is just waiting for months while you run out of food and uh but during the middle of the night reportedly they used the vines that were in the area and they Batman their way down and then uh, did a, a night ambush. And they were, they were experts at hit and run. Um, Spartacus appealed to the common man because I mean, this was like early feudalism in a way, um, you know, Crassus, especially he's the one who's trying it's, it's kind of this it's poetic. Uh, Spartacus is a, a man of the people. He apparently was all about spread, sharing the loot, letting it like spread out. And then Crassus over here, his enemy, the person who's pursuing him, is literally the richest man and one of the strongest people in Rome. And so there's there's something poetic about the richest man trying to destroy this 
uh, Robin Hood character almost. So, and he did, I mean, he, he, he kept going, but because of the rallying of Spartacus, his, his uh, reach to touch um, so many people, he was able to rally and, and survive uh, independently for so long. I had, a, there was a great article in uh, live science.com from Owen Jarris. And it, it, it talks about this. And I'll note too, the thing is every single thing you find out is prefaced with may have, or, or is ended with may have. There's just not, there's just not so much. I mean, especially because of, it wasn't like he was essentially a Roman hero. In fact, uh, several writers thought he was going to Rome uh, instead. Uh, Apian and Florus were other um, historians of Greek and Roman um uh, times who, who suggested that that's what the goal was. And if you look, they kind of, they went up to the Alps and then kind of, and went back down. Um, yeah, so it looked like they were going that way, but they had to, it, I think Apian said, explains why they had to turn around. Yeah. It, I think once they got to the Alps, um, at the point, like they had a lot of Germanic and Gaul, uh, people, um, in their army. And so that was a great opportunity to bounce, you know, go, go to Germania, just get out of there and stuff like that. And uh, I know that there were some, there were Gaul leaders um, that like the, they couldn't unite after a while. They started having, sp they started splitting the ideas of, of what they should do. But uh, eventually uh, Sicily was a goal and they tried to use boats um, through pirates. And if you trust pirates, you're going to get screwed. <laughs> and that's what happened. But Sicily was, it's, it's a Sicily is historically since ancient Greek, has been a, a, a breadbasket. It's super agricultural, really great land. And so that was a good idea, but yeah, Crassus is coming and they were unable to sail. Uh, and Crassus was in, insanely crazy. So he brought back this old Roman practice is what it's called. Uh, it's, it's called decimation, you know, uh, dec like 10 um, deca, uh, so where units that ran away from the enemy would draw lots and have a number of soldiers killed by being clubbed or stoned to death. So you would have like lots and then every 10 and, and it was just kind of crazy. I think so like, that's where our modern day word comes from. Right. Yeah. That's, that's to decimate you like decimate. It means to destroy in a way. And right. that's, that's what it does. It destroys your fear of, um, or your ability to leave the, to, to run, um, the army. So anyway, uh, after heavy losses, Spartacus forces split, defeated. Um, he attacked Crassus anyway. Um, Plutarch uh, describes that Spartacus uh, got off of his horse before the final battle, killed his horse, and told his men that if he won the battle, he would have uh, so many fine horses it didn't matter. But if he lost, he doesn't need a horse. So it was kind of good. I mean, I remember reading history books uh, a lot of the times, especially – when you'd have, um, I think it was during the Crusades, it, one of the Crusades, they like sailed over, landed um, on the other side of the Mediterranean and then burned boats. And they're like, we're doing this. We're not, we're not going back home. So anyway, uh, it, the, the Servile Wars are the next like big topic here. And they were really important. And in fact, there's a whole uh, section on Wikipedia called Slavery in Ancient Rome. And it's, it's really interesting because there is, you know, Rome, anyone could be Roman. Like that was one kind of benefit to Rome for the most part was after a while, you just kind of got absorbed into the cultural orbit. And sometimes your cultures kind of came, your, your, your own practices, your indigenous practices came over, but the Roman stuff really took over because of how, how potent Roman culture was and how just the way the, 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 the empire worked, it, it just made sense. And servitude. Like that's why, what we try to do in America Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's like, don't beat them, join them. Like, you know, you, you, Rome will be as big as anyone who says I'm Roman now will let them, you know, that's the best way to expand your empire is you've already got people there. Just make them, make them Roman. And it, it's, it's, it's been a long time thing. I mean, Alexander the great was known for marrying his generals to Persian, um, uh, to, to Persian like families once he took over and things like that and an Indian and as he went through I mean that's that's the easiest and quickest way to expand your empire just take the people that are there and make them what make them look at you and say I'm you you know and that was a big thing for Rome and and servitude was a huge thing uh, it, it was very important to the culture and the economy it like it wasn't ethnic but it was regional and it was there was a ton of people there were there were 
it, it was a super populated area. And uh, again, like this, we got to this boiling point, it looks like several times with the Serval Wars. And the third Serval War just sort of was the one of the more successful ones. And none of them went specifically um, successful. But I guess just through time and through the manpower that he had, uh, just just did it. Um, I have a little thing, actually. So, yeah, the first Serval War was 135 to 132 BC. So it didn't last very long at all. I mean, they all didn't last too long, two to four years. Uh, it, this was specifically in Sicily, uh, led by Eunice, a former slave, uh, claiming to be a prophet. Um, the second one was 104 to 100, so 30 years later, also in Sicily, led by uh, these two dudes. And then the third Serval War was the mainland, led by Spartacus. Um, no evidence. This is one interesting thing that I did clip from the Wikipedia articles. That's where I got my Serval War information, is it mentions that there was no evidence to truly reform and remove slavery. And so that's that's one other interesting point to think about was this wasn't necessarily about stopping the practice. It was just about escaping their fate of the practice. I and mean, it was extremely unfair. I mean, the, I, I don't know. You could debate the fairness of it all. But I imagine, you know, you you, you have some some small city state that's rebelling in uh, Asia Minor, you pound them, you take them. I mean, that, that, and then you sell them into slavery markets. You make them work for you. I mean, it, it makes sense that, especially as Rome began, it makes sense the idea. And we just talked about Saturnalia being one of the most important festivals because it 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 decreased those social norms. The the servants and slaves. Well, I don't, it didn't really mention too much on slaves, but the servants could. They had freedom. They they weren't as bound to the moral. Uh, problems. They could go gamble. They could wear different clothing that they normally couldn't wear and stuff like that. So I, I just want to point out, because there's so much there, I want to point out how important servitude and slavery was. And it, it was it was a very essential, different part of their culture. I don't think it's something that we can think of when we think of it today. It, it, it's a little different back then. Um, and, and, and I... The, I will mention uh, a lot of times the Romans like to take Greek slaves because they were so well educated so they could teach their children sure. Greek and, and Latin even. Yeah. That's a really great point. Yeah, that is. Um, so the last thing really here is today. Spartacus became, I mean, very specifically Karl Marx is, is really a, a big reason why he, he is as relevant as ever. And it's because Karl Marx listed him as the most, I'm going to quote here, the most splendid fellow in whole in the whole of ancient history and a great general noble character and real representative of the ancient proletariat. So that's a pretty nice standing. And it, it's, it's really interesting, though. Throughout time, I mean, you know, these texts would get discovered and rediscovered, especially through the 12th century into the Renaissance. We started relearning these characters uh, rebirth. That's what the Renaissance was all about was this rebirth of all of these ancient things. It's like, we already knew this, we just forgot it. And so I'm sure that helps kind of keep these things going. And a lot of these things, you know, they're, they're just footnotes in the history of Rome, the servile wars, two to four years, they're important enough to say, oh yeah, this is when the servile war happened. And this is what happened. And Spartacus is just interesting enough because he was very successful for uh, a period of time that he he did do it. Probably it seems like it was the most successful of the Serval Wars, and it just kind of petered out um, at the end there. But uh, because of Karl Marx and and his comments, it really and and it makes sense. It, it, he's a huge icon for communists and socialists. Um, he's a hero. He's he's a myth essentially. Um, he's he's literally a legend, legendary figure, and he's he's very Robin Hood like. But it, it, it's it's somewhat different. I mean, he he literally uprose and killed the the terrible leaders and again it's poetic how just crass is, is just so like evil and he's like a disney like villain he, he's rich he's head of uh the roman triumvirate i mean it's it's kind of crazy but one funny thing that i'll mention too with the influence of today is the fact that there are so many um like uh in the eastern block of like the balkan slavic and the soviet block former soviet countries there's a ton of sports teams named for spartacus so that just became a thing to like add the name to your uh to your like team name. And there's even, there's a famous Spartacus books. Um, it's one of the, the longest running collectively run leftist bookstores in North America is also named his honor. So 
it it makes sense. It's pretty simple, but I think Karl Marx had a big uh, idea or big um, hand in, in uplifting the name. And then, of course, in 1960, the film Spartacus, uh, Kirk Douglas, that's what it was. Um, it was based off of a novel, Spartacus, by Howard Fast. And this became a, a huge success. It kind of helped uh, – the the what do they call it the sword and sandal culture that's the kind of the genre of that it, it helped play into that and gave us an idea yeah, helped form the modern idea of how we view Rome. It helped inspire movies like 300, which then took it a little further in in both a fantasy but also a realistic kind of aspect. Um, my favorite film. I did not see Spartacus. I did not watch the show really. I watched a little bit when it first kind of started, but was uh, Russell Crowe in Gladiator. Um, so good. Yes, it was really good. And there, it had its own problems, but I think it did a great job of um, sort of fixing a lot of the problems that that genre has. The It it it, it did, I remember like- Wait, you can was that on, supposed to be based on Spartacus? It was a, a thousand percent inspired by it. It was based on actually- Okay, because it was set later, thing. like much later, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, uh, Marcus Aurelius and his uh, dummy son that Joaquin Phoenix played- um, Oh God! Oh, it starts with the C, doesn't it? Oh boy, I watched okay. that movie like a hundred times. He was the it was Marcus Aurelius' son, um, and he names Russell Crowe's character uh, the the Marcus Aurelius because he's old and he's dying, and um, names Russell Crowe's character as emperor before he dies. But his son, um, Com Commodus. There we oh, go. Oh yeah, Commodus, oh, okay. who was With a real lion. He always wore that lion or lion pelt or he, whatever, but he, he never was, did anything. Yeah, he was like, "I'm actually Hercules's, you know, great nephew. Um, I'm gonna go get drunk." Yeah, he he ran it to the ground, but it's just and it, so it's it's a cool like nonfiction but lots of fiction or it's a cool fictional story with lots of nonfiction built in. They did have a lot of problems. Um, they had like siege equipment in the woods and the Germanic tribes looked like they were straight out of like the bronze age. Um, like they, you know, it, they, they took some liberties, but there was a lot there that was really cool. And, and one, like the, um, the owner of Russell Crowe's character, he was like a former gladiator slave who got his freedom. I like that. I think it does a good job of showing like the economy and the cultural side of it. And it's really cool. It, lots of blood and gore um, and, and stuff like that. So it, it was it was a really cool film, and it I think it helped um, usher in sort of the age of films starting to go on the more realistic side instead of on the corny, fake fantasy side of it. So it had some issues, but overall, I think it was really um, really nice way to go, and I would recommend watching it. My mother loves the Spartacus show. I'm sure it did a good job. I don't know how accurate it was, but it, it probably would have had a lot of great content. I mean, the, it there's a clear beginning and end. I hate shows that go on and on, but there's a clear beginning and end, and there's some interesting characters. There's lots of great Roman figures that you can see and, and hear. But anyway, uh, I would highly recommend checking out Gladiator. Gladiator. I, I watched it. It's been too long since I watched it. When I was a kid... I would watch it almost every day during the summer, like in the afternoon with my sister and my dad, and we would just watch it over and over and over again. So I, I've, <laughs> I need to watch it again. Cause I used to watch the the movie, the Patriot with Mel Gibson and I rewatched that and it's terrible. So <laughs> when I rewatched it, <laughs> I, I, I do want to say, uh, yeah. I misspoke earlier is the first triumvirate. The second triumvirate oh, okay. was, uh, Octavian, uh, Mark Anthony, Anthony and, uh, Lapidus? F, F minus. Maybe. Yeah, I know. So I do want to say <laughs> yeah, that. But there's no, a wonderful um show that I believe either H it must have been HBO because I can see it on Hulu. Um did called Rome and it said yeah. it starts in the first triumvirate and then kind of the I think there's only two seasons, but it yeah ends heard, with Octavian and becoming Augustus. And it is a very, cool. very good show. Yeah, I heard it was good. I heard it, the end kind of went a little wonky, but I heard it was a good show as well. So yeah, there's tons of great stuff right around this period. This was a super influential period. And again, the Serval Wars were just an important part of this like cultural shift. And it just happened to get some recognition. And then really like into the Renaissance age, looking back into the classical period, classical period and into the enlightenment when you, so you, you get into the enlightenment era and then you, you reintroduce the classical text with rationality, um, rational thinking. And then you get these modern ideas. I think that's where the cool part is, is it's the, the old, old 
dog getting new tricks in a way or the other way around. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> new tricks getting an old dog. There we go. <laughs> and <laughs> um, I think that about covers it. Uh, Cammy, thank you so much for your story on Spartacus. Everyone, if you go to Mount Vesuvius and you're being pursued, don't forget the vines. Just vine on down and take them out. That's about all I can say. <laughs> Cammy, is that all? Did I, did I forget anything? Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much covers it. Awesome, Follow, everyone. Like, subscribe. <laughs> yes, all that good stuff. Um, please join us on Facebook. That's a great way to, to get in touch. And uh, have a happy new year, too. That's in two days from when this will post. So please be safe and take care of yourselves. Happy New Year. All right, everyone. We'll see you next time.